Father, tonight, as we stand in labor of love, with, this, with Dr. Hawthorne and his precious wife in the body, the fellowship and the body of believers who have gathered, I thank you, Lord God, for the grace, the anointing, the dance, the praise, the worship, the prophetic song, the, the inspirational word that was spoken. I give you praise and honor, Father. I thank you for the anointing that is here. And it is your grace and your anointing and your mercy that delivers God. Father, I thank you that I keep that in mind always. I always will humble myself before the mighty hand of God. And know that it is his grace and his word that is delivering people. And Father, I give you glory and honor and praise for this young man that just played in saxophone and, and deposited it out of himself into us, even in his own struggle. But God, I find that's the way that it is. That if we wait till we have no problem, then that day we will all be in your presence and this body shall take on a new one like unto yours. But while we are here, we will warfare, we'll battle, we'll have victories. And sometimes we'll just press and let the word of God be true despite all we're going through. In Jesus' name. Now, Lord God, let the anointing of God and the word of God right now destroy the yokes of the enemy. Expose him, strip him of his power. Take away his authority. And, Lord God, bring deliverance and healing, mind, body, soul, and spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And amen. He may be seated. Hallelujah. To the young prophet that was up here earlier, where you at? Awesome. The word of the Lord wanted me to speak to you and let you know something, young man, that the warfare and the battle that has come against you, that has been raging and pressing hard against you. The spirit of the Lord God said, because I have deposited a sure word of prophecy within thee, the enemy have desired to shut you down and to gag your voice and to take away your fervor, fervor and fight. But know of an assurity that every word that I have spoken to you and every word that I have spoken in my word in general shall rise up and do great and mighty things on the inside of you. Be not dismayed, neither be you discomforted, save the spirit of the living God. But stand ye strong, hold your voice and only speak what I am saying. And you shall see the enemy shortly under your feet. And all that he has desired to do shall be brought to naught, to nothing, except the spirit of the living God. Let's give God a great big hand, praise him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to go directly into the word. I don't think I need to do a whole lot of introducing myself. Most of the time, between flyers and everything else folks have heard about us, that's enough. Amen. I think, amen, at the end of the day, we need to let the Lord have his way. And that's all that's really going to matter, isn't it? Open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3, chapter 12, verse 43. Matthew chapter 12, verse 43. I want y'all to roll with me because we're going to hit hard and hit hard. Amen? Glory be to God. The title of tonight's message is Warring with the Enemy, Without and Within. Warring with the Enemy. From without and within. Now let me share something with you in case you don't know me. I do not believe that the devil is always doing something. And we live a life frighteningly binding and loosing all the time. I wake up in the morning and the last thing on my mind is the demon. When I wake up in the morning, I wake up rejoicing that the Lord has given me a brand new day to get her done. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. We have fun. We travel all over the nation, all over the world. Amen. And you know, we've got people to intercede with us. But we're not spooky. When we teach spiritual warfare, it makes sense. Amen? Amen. And so we're going to break off some things that make sense. I can tell you this. If it looks like you, I'm doing the same thing I did the last time you saw, you saw me. You're absolutely right. It's called consistency. <laughs> See, I have one clear-cut agenda. That's to preach balance deliverance across the nation. And then go directly back home with Jesus. You feel me? See, when you know what you're supposed to be doing, do that. Sometimes we spend a lifetime doing everybody else and everything else. But when you do what he called you to do and just do that, the anointing will only rest on that. Look at your neighbor and say, do you and Jesus. 
Amen. Don't try to do everybody else. Just do you. Matter of fact, you want to help yourself tonight. Work on you. Tell your neighbor. Say neighbor. So and so should have been here. But they're not. So just maybe. We better do us. Give God a great big hand praise. Warring with the enemy without and within. This message, I'm going to tell you the genesis of this message. It is given an understanding how the enemy works to draw you back into bondage. Because see, to me, it's not whether one can give their life to the Lord. It's whether we can maintain that stand. When we hear in the news about great preachers doing crazy stuff, it's not because they're not strong. Sometimes it's because we do not realize that just because the Lord gloriously saved you, you still got issues. Now I put it like this, Dr. Hawthorne, some stuff we can put in a tuxedo and it looks good, but still be a mess underneath. Deliverance is something that you don't find deliverance in the tuxedo. It's the guerrilla warfare. Really, when you get down to deliverance, it deals with the ugly stuff that you wish folk didn't know. But you know you need to be delivered. Yeah. Amen? So we're going to break down tonight how they understand how the enemy reactivates, restores stuff in your life that you thought you were saved from. See, being saved just means you've been ransomed. But when they took it, when God ransomed us, he actually brought a product that needed him to perfect. Did y'all get that? He actually purchased with his own blood an imperfect product. And he said, I'm going to take this home because I'm the manufacturer, the author, and the finisher of our faith. And I'm going to finish this. Look at your neighbor and say, you ain't finished. And you'll show up saved. You are called, but you're not finished. All right, look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 43. Jesus made a curious statement, and we're going to work with it a little bit. It said, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he, the unclean spirit, walks through waterless or dry places seeking rest and finds none. I.e., when God redeems us, when God breaks things in our lives, the strongholds that were dominant. Somebody say dominant? dominant. Strongholds. Now let me explain something. A dominant stronghold in our lives is not just, I felt like doing such and such. How many, how many of you know what God dominantly saved you from? I'm talking about not a miserable life of sin. No, no, it wasn't miserable to you then. <laughs> Somebody said dominant stronghold. Sometimes dominant strongholds can be stuff that is a part of your attitude that you had all your life. And even though you're in church, it's still there. There are spirits attached to certain areas of our life. And then there are spirits that ain't bothering certain areas. In other words, there are things that is in our carnal nature that demons go, I can't really bother that. Why? It's hedged up. God has put a fence. How many of y'all got dogs? Even if it's a big or a little one. You got a fence? That little thing sometimes gets like, Wah! ties up like as if it's going to tie something up, don't it? And anything outside the fence will stand and look at it and say, is that what's doing all that barking? That's the carnal mind. That's the carnality. A little chihuahua. Barking loud at everything that goes by and you actually think it's a big thing. Our carnal mind, we can put him to death, bang, like that. You can resist him. You can crucify him. You can put him to death. But when you have a doorway or a gateway in your life that is demonically fueled, the demonic bondage has the same name as the action. Lust. Lying. Stealing. Anger. Bitterness. Unforgiveness. Now there is anger that ain't a demon. Matter of fact, the Lord said, won't be angry if it's something necessary to be angry about. But sin not. But then there is an anger that is fueled 
by demonic drive. Now, how do you know it's demonic? Glad you asked. The demonic anger don't forgive. Just stays mad. Matter of fact, the demonic anger goes, you're okay with Bobby, but if you ever make him mad, he's done with you. Translation, in case it's one of you, that means if anybody makes you mad, your inability to forgive is so strong, you're so bound by a demon of unforgiveness that you have to fight to let him go. Look at your neighbor and say, that's a stronghold. And now that is, if it was general anger or general unforgiveness, you will feel like, you know, I ain't never going to forget what they've done to me. Anybody ever been there? I'll never speak to them again. And then all of a sudden, your little tender heart, they come back and they don't even halfway apologize. You just look up and say, you know what? I, I ain't even going to hate you because you, you're just silly. You made me mad. <laughs> Anybody ever been like that? But see, that's when you have to crucify your self-life. That's crucifixion. Did you notice? It's easier to crucify and put to death the deeds of the flesh, the carnal mind. But when it's fueled by a demonic drive, you save sanctified and rustling with it. You speaking in tongues and rustling with it. Matter of fact, you're pretty good as long as nobody touches that thing. Anybody ever had an ouchie that you said, look, I'm hurting here. And yet somebody goes, right now, he's what you touching for. That's the way strongholds are in our life. They're there, and you feel you're pretty good, and actually feel like you're getting healed. Until somebody touches it. Tonight, we want the Holy Ghost to touch some stuff. Now let me go ahead and work a little bit more. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he, the unclean spirit, walks through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he said, I will return into my house from which I came out. And when he has come, when he runs to return to the house, he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. If it was a, if you're talking about a believer's life and commitment to God, there is a place where we are supposed to be emptied out of ourselves, but filling ourselves with God. But when we don't embrace God in these areas, in this specific area, it's empty. The word swept here means it has been cleaned out, but no furniture. Just swept. Garnished comes from a word which means to polish the outside. So what we got? Empty, <laughs> swept, and looking good. And the demons go, huh, you empty. You swept, and your outside is looking good to folk. But guess what? You're going to have a spirit in you one or the other. Either God or me. Demonic strongholds in all of mankind. You got to understand, the enemy hates mankind. He wants to get within. No, your spirit man don't have no demon. No demon can fit in your spirit man. The Bible said the spirit of the man is the candle of the Lord, such as the inner power, so the belly. My spirit worships God. But where do these strongholds hit? They hit the mind. They hit the soulless realm. They hit the physical body. Is everybody understanding me? So don't go running the house. Well, he said we're so full of demons. We're demon possessed and out of our mind. Matter of fact, the word possessed in the original language is demonoxomite, which means to be under the influence of a demon to a lesser or a greater degree. Not the American word possess. Because the American definition of the word possess means you own something. Everybody got that? Now, why does the enemy, when he goeth, it says, first of all, he found him empty, swept, and gore. Then he go off and take with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the, fir worse than the first. What the enemy wants to do is he wants us not to feel areas. He wants us not to deal with things so that he can get in there and operate. And what's unique about it, the outside looks good. And you're running a ministry. The outside looks good. And you have all kinds of authority and position. But you're not dealing with the inside. This is the inside job here. Somebody said deal with the inside. 
This is why you can be saved for years but not deal with the inside. And eventually when you weaken enough, when you're beat down enough. Listen, let me tell you this. This is first ivory one and one. Listen to me real good. What the enemy does is, if, when he's, if he's able to break your spirit, man, to beat you down, his main job is to get you to revert back to the last thing that gave you pleasure. Did you notice he, uh, uh, the Egyptians, when the children of Israel had their brains beat out by the Egyptians, but just as soon as things didn't go right in the wilderness, where did they want to go back to? Onions and links. So understand this. When the unclean spirit has grown out of us, they seek. They seek the dominant stronghold that our soulish corner realm has been attached to and they ruled in it. I want you to hear this. Every one of us in here, me included, has a dominant stronghold that if we don't keep ourselves together, if we do not rely on the Holy Spirit, that's what I mean when keep ourselves together. If we don't serve God and resist the enemy, that'll be the one he will try to pull us back with. No matter how cute everybody thinks about you, at the end of the day, you know what your stronghold is. Can I tell you all something here? You know how come the deliverance is going to be so powerful this weekend? Because you're going to deal with it. See, people sometimes come up to me, you're supposed to be the general of deliverance. All right, tell me what my stronghold is. I look at you as, you're supposed to be human. You've lived in that head that long. You deal with it. <laughs> How many know what they ain't got to, got to can't help us in? You know what you're wrestling with. Everybody in here, some of us ain't gonna tell everybody, and I'm glad you don't. <laughs> Are you with me? You know what your stronghold is. You know what talks to you. This is the man of God. This is the reason why I, I, I preach to hundreds and hundreds of the fivefold ministry. And this is why when I look out on the audience at the fivefold ministry, amen, they never intimidate me looking all proud like they're just fine, praise God. And this young man is preaching to the rest of the saints. I go, brother, don't play me. <laughs> because every single one of us, all of us, got an area in our life that if not but for the grace of God it, it will take you out you've been saved for years and it still talks to you you've been saved for years and it still pulls at you you over top of this auxiliary that auxiliary license entitled and it still speaks to you don't play me because I know better Amen. call that beast what it is go to 2 Corinthians 1 9 I ain't going to be before you long. This is an exact... Now listen, look at your neighbor and say, this is a process. process. Salvation, instantaneous. Sometimes, and I don't have a death wish. Minister Donna, I don't have a death wish. But there are sometimes I wish the day I got saved, the Lord said, come out of the body now. Come to me quick right now. Anybody ever been there? Come on back to me now before you do something dumb. And you know what, bro? Hey, hey, man of God, it's like, you know, you get saved and the Lord gives you a little furlough. I think that furlough he gives you is just, let me let them get to stay in the joy of this thing. Let me let them get a little bit maturity. And then all of a sudden, you roll along pretty good. And then all of a sudden, bang! What the world? Somebody said, my stuff starts operating. But, I, but I'm saved. I have ministered to thousands of people who are saved but they didn't know what you and I know they didn't know that their stuff the enemy that the enemy is attached to would eventually rise up if he could position them in the right place this ain't checkers baby this is chess now let's look at this 2 Corinthians 1 9 everybody got it Amen. I'm going to float on with this. Y'all follow me, aren't you? Look what, what Paul is saying. The second Corinthians 1 9 says, But we had the senses of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but trust in God who raised us from the dead. Isn't that not right? Amen. All right, now watch this. Look at verse 10. Now, this is, this is the way the churches teach, and, and I'm going to explain why some ministries you can set in and actually not get your deliverance. Because what they're saying is true, but it's not the whole truth. Watch this. 
But we had the senses of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves. But in God which raised the dead. Who delivered us. Somebody say he delivered us. Yeah. Now right there the word, the word, uh, when I use the term process, a process is an advanced proceeding of something. A process, this makes a difference what I'm saying. A process is marked by gradual change. Leading towards a particular result. Stay with me. There's a reason I'm doing this. Our salvation, instantaneously forgiven, it's a process. How many of y'all know you're a process? We are a work in motion. The word process means an advance proceeding in a direction. I'm going somewhere with this. The word process means something is marked by gradual changes that leads toward a particular result. And that particular result that's gradually changing in our process is to be more like him. Everybody got that? But if you're in a teaching that teaches, watch this Dr. Hawthorne. It says, but we had the sentence of death in us that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raised the dead, who delivered us. Somebody say, stop. stop. One school of thought is, you are already delivered because it says he delivered us. Therefore, you're just fine and you don't need all this praying. Because you're delivered. Got that? So therefore, the enemy takes the gospel just like he would with deliverance. Deliverance can be so messed up and tell, all you can see is you got demons. I got demons. We got to get delivered. Sorry. That's crazy. Somebody said, that ain't balanced. Here goes something else that's not balanced. To take this word that says he already delivered us and think that's an approval that you don't need deliverance. The word who have delivered us actually means it is to put, it's positionally already done before the foundation of the world. So when I am coming up, dealing with something in my carnal nature, coming against me, I want the enemy to know I got a right to be free because God already done it before the foundation of the world. Got that? But now watch it. If you're at that church, that says you're already delivered, therefore you don't need no deliverance. What's the problem with that? You will keep your demons and they will ride and eventually take you out. And then you'll be, oh, but that was the big teacher that everybody saw on TV. Anybody, anybody get that? So what does it mean he doth deliver us? That is our position in which we stand to let the enemy know no matter what I'm battling, God already done the work before the foundation of the world. He had the plan. He had it all set up. And that's why I'm standing. Therefore, I ain't letting you have this. It's almost, bro, like you having a house and somebody saying, well, uh, that's my house because my granddad and them used to live there. Do you have a lien on it? No. Uh, do you own any of your property? No. Do you have any proof that it's your house? No. Well, guess what you're going to do? Well, guess what? I know what you say your granddaddy did, but here goes what I got. Why? Because I well, have what positionally this is where I stand. Here goes the next one. Who delivered us? Now watch this. Let me read it again. Who delivered us from so great a dust? Death. Who delivered us from so great a death? I mean it's already done. Somebody said the word doth deliver. Death. Say it with me. Doth deliver. Death. The word doth deliver means God is doing it now. Yeah. Yeah. Delivering us now, presently doing it. Who delivered positionally? Who doth deliver doing it now? Got that? How many need some right now freedom? Yeah. How many need some right now breakthroughs? Yeah. How many when you gave your life to the Lord, you, when you gave it to him, you know that he had already delivered you and all you were doing was accepting the work that was already done? Yeah. Somebody got this? Here goes the next one. And whom we should trust. Let's let this. Y'all working with me? Now bear with me, babies. Who delivered us from so great a death? Doth deliver us. And read this with me, the other part. And whom we trust that he will what? Yes. Now wait a minute. If it was no, no, wait a minute. Stop. 
if it was no more delivering factor, why would it say he, do, he yet delivers us? What it is saying is God has made the provision for your breakthrough before, during, and after. Come on, somebody. Say it with me. God has made provision for my victory before, during, and after. Somebody said, that's the total package. Give the Lord a great big hand, please. Hallelujah. So, now, some of the re- ways that the enemy uses to try to pull us back, although the foundation has already been made, is Peter, Jesus said it to Peter. It was a curious thing. Watch this, Luke 22, Luke 22, verse 31 through 33. St. Luke 22, 31 through 33. Peter's intentions was to serve Jesus with all that was in him. Y'all got that? There's a point that I'm sure you didn't work with me. Because some of the ways that the enemy pulls us back in to bind us up and to unleash stuff on us is sifting. Somebody say sifting. Look what Jesus says to Peter. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan have desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brother. And he said unto him, Lord, I'm ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. Got that? And Jesus said, Simon, in one translation it said in verse 31, Simon, Simon, Satan has permission to sift you. (laughs) Did you get that? Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor. There's no battle. That the enemy is taking us through. That he doesn't get permission. And he only got permission for our learning and also because we have power over him. Give God a big, big hand praise. Let me make it better. Let me make it better for you. You can handle what you have to handle. Mm-hmm. You're not designed for my trials. I'm not designed for yours. But you have been constructed by God to handle whatever issue that comes your way. You know why? Because you were made by the manufacturer and you're only one copy. And ain't but one place you can go to get anything fixed. It's back to the manufacturer. Give the Lord a great big hand, praise. If you saw Ivory in my early 16, 17, 18 years old, I was a total drug addict, drug dealer. Got that? Got it. Not an apostle to nobody's eyes. <laughs> Not a little minister in training. Dope seller. Addict. Cocaine sniffer. And today, I'm one of, one of the many powerful deliverance ministries in America. But before the foundation of the earth, God had already said so. Prophet, my mother looked at me at 17 years old and told me, boy, you got to get in church. You, you backslid, you got to get yourself together. And I'm looking at her, look, I was, man, I was hooking up a date that night, bro. <laughs> and when she spoke that to me, she said, I saw you preaching to all races of people. I laughed at her. I said, mom, I went to a little hole in this church in the backwoods of Lincoln. Y'all know where Lincoln, Delaware is, don't you? That's my point. In the backwoods of Lincoln, Delaware. Y'all looked at me like, huh? In the backwoods of Lincoln, Delaware, not even a white person will go there. And you're telling me I'm going to preach to all races of people. I said, yeah, I hooked that date right up. I know y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Minister Donald, but when God got finished, somebody said when God got finished. When God got finished, amen, he broke yokes. He set me free. Amen. He saved me gloriously. He brought his anointing. He started perfecting me. And I still had a beast that would operate. When I would be beat down, when I would feel like backsliding, I know y'all ain't been, I'm talking about me. What would call me was drugs. I said, this is nuts. I got filled with the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues and that with a mighty burning fire. <laughs> I didn't never hear about this deliverance stuff. 
Never heard about casting anything out. And the way that the enemy pulled me back into the stronghold was sifting. Somebody said sifting. sifting. My brother from South Africa, I was raised up my mama and grandmama used to take flour, you know. And they'd take this thing and go around and, and flour would fall and you'd get the lumps out of it. That's the way the enemy does to us. He goes around and around with his garbage until he can sift you. And, and what it is, it's trying to get something out of you. And what pe- happened to Peter was, now watch this. Somebody said, look at this now. When Peter, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Satan have desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. When he sifted Peter down enough, he came in contact with Peter's stronghold that even Paul had to rebuke. And that stronghold was, under pressure, Peter would flip on you. Now watch this, because I like to help these scholars that say, well, that was before the Holy Ghost, my dear brother. Well, let me work with you, my dear scholar. (laughs) Paul had to tell Peter, why would you renege and back away when you know that God is saving all races and nations? When Peter was faced with confrontation, when Peter was faced with confrontation, Peter, even after the Holy Ghost, still had to deal with that carnal man. That part of him that would fold. Thank God he looks like he got delivered from the cussing part at least. (laughs) Are you understanding what I'm showing you? I will give it enough to tell you that it did not record Peter having to have a demon cast out with him. It was a part of his carnal nature. But this sifting here that God Jesus talked about, you saw something a little bit heavier than the carnal nature. When he was confronted, Jesus said, Satan is behind this. Satan is sifting you. Pete, Satan was good as telling Jesus, like Job was told, yeah, he ain't gonna do nothing because you got a hedge around him. And he, the sifting was the order to pull down the hedge. Look at your neighbor and say, sifting, sifting is about, about pulling down the hedge. Now, what is a hedge? The word hedge means to shut in. It means to shut in, protection, restraint. That's what a hedge is. Hedge, you're shut in. You're protected. And there's a restraint on you. But if I can sift you, keep having stuff happen. Disillusionment, trouble, stress, rejection. Just, just, I want one thing right up another over and over and over. After a while, I'll get you cussing again. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? When the enemy finished sifting Peter and Satan did it, Peter not only denied the Lord, he cussed. Do you understand me? Somebody give God a great big hand praise. So, if you being sifted here, you may need some deliverance from the stronghold in your life that the sifting is activating. It's not the trial. It's what, he's, what it's trying. I done lost two people. Said it real slow. It's not the trial. It's what it's trying in you. It's what it's sifting It realizes, listen, you know why the same old foolishness keeps coming at you? And what we say sometimes, I wish they'd just leave me alone. This is just getting on my last nerves. That's the one. The enemy will keep it coming at you because he's got something in you. Jesus said it like this. The wicked one cometh and hath nothing in me. But he has something in us. He knows how to pull our strings. Are you hearing me? Mm-hmm. I'm moving right along. Somebody's moving right along. Sifting. Now, here goes another way that the enemy can attack and cause to position us so that we better be careful because we'll need deliverance. He is going after what's in us. Are you hearing me? Look at Galatians 6 9. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. Dr. Hawthorne, I call this the church one. This is the church stronghold. Now what I mean, why do I call it the church stronghold? Because Galatians 6, 9, and 10 is where you go in bondage for doing right. In other words, not, 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 
You don't get all bound up because of sin. You get all bound up because you did right in God. And folk come at you. And situations come at you, preacher. Until it breaks your spirit. You ain't seen nothing yet until you've seen a bishop, an apostle, an elder of the church get so wounded that they no longer want to minister to the church. You ain't seen nothing till you see someone called, hate to go to their own church. Across the country, I prayed, I have prayed for thousands of pastors' wives who are devastated by the ministry itself. Wounded warriors still working. And girlfriend is going like, I'm trying to hold on and not say nothing. Holding all that pain, not getting delivered. Looking like a first lady. But on the inside, tore right up. I'm preaching to somebody in here. And the wound and the hurt is deep. And sister girl, brother, you're holding it together because you won't, don't want to discourage the saints. You're holding it together because you don't want to break your husband's spirit. You're holding it together because it don't look good for pastor, pastor's wife or elder's wife to act this way. But what has happened with you, you've become weary in well-doing. See, see it, look what it says here. Let us not be weary in well-doing. What? Say it with me. Let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap when? If we faint not. So what does this stronghold do? It causes you to be weary in well-doing so you'll faint. The word weary translates to be worn out in strength, energy, freshness, having one's patience, tolerance, or exhausted. When you become weary and well-doing, you are worn out in strength. Matter of fact, you don't want to see another thing. Your energy is zapped out. Your freshness is gone. You ain't even got no revelation. Pulling back on old sermons. Almost hoping that pastor don't ask you to do something. <laughs> now y'all are laughing, but can I tell you something? That there's, there's almost a universal sign when people start in the backslide right in the church. You start either backing off of the work you do in God or you start moving back in chairs. <laughs> the front row begins to shift. You, it's not musical chairs. Pretty soon you won't come through the door. By the way, if the enemy has got you where you are isolated from the church, he is positioning you so that he can attack the mind more effectively with no interference. Thus locked in your own room with yourself and your demons. Are you hearing me? This is the reason why at a good delivery service, please don't bring me for a deliverance. I'm not just generally talking about you. This is just anybody in the world. Please don't bring me for a deliverance service and think that I'm going to just spare everybody. What I'm talking about is from the pulpit to the door. That's the way these things are set up. A man of God, Dr. Hawthorne, I've seen hundreds and hundreds of pastors that hear me preach like this and they be in their office. While the folks in their congregation is sitting there. I've even had a few where I've said to them, we you going to get your deliverance, Doc? Are you hearing me? Or you get this. The elders who need most deliverance not come to it nor come up. But you can see they're bound. Family bound. Is y'all all right? See, I'm just saying. See, you're shocked when it's some headline preacher, ain't we? I just don't understand what happened to Reverend Totenfolk, who was known by everybody, had the biggest mega ministry in town. Oh, I understand. Folk, I'm like, they're shocked. I'm not shocked. I go, my God, you was a walking time bomb. When world, one of the mentors of my life, a man that I read much of his material, been through a few of his services. One of the things when world used to say that stayed with me was that there is such a thing as a walking time bomb. What is a walking time bomb? I'm glad you asked. It's where God raises you up, uses you for his kingdom, but you don't get the deliverance you need. You pray for everyone else, but don't get your own freedom. 
what would eventually happen. Did you, first of all, my question to us all, did you really think you're going to minister to everyone and you don't need any? Uh, Are you really thinking you're that unique, wonderful icon that doesn't need freedom? You can't possibly be that deceived that the rules change for you. I'm just, I'm just being straight up honest with you. And so what happens is, item, newsflash, preacher found in a hotel with cocaine. Newsflash, preacher exposed, pure flat homosexuality, sleeping with different boys in the church. Newsflash. Newsflash. Money being stolen and embezzled because they're trying to live like the lifestyles of the rich and problemless. Had a demon of greed before they had the church. Just took it in the church. I preached a message one time and I said, how, how, how many demons did you bring in the church with you that you, that you live with? The bottom line, what I love about deliverance is it brings us all down level to the same place. Man of God, I'm not looking for it to be super popular. I'm looking for it to be super effective. Because all of these grandeur false flyers running around with all this stuff claiming what they are, eventually God will bring them to the place, as my prayer, where they will get the freedom they need. Just before I read a little bit further. Anybody got that? You become weary and well-doing. Your, your, your messages, remember how the messages used to turn you on? They don't now, do they? Remember you used to play your song? You remember your song? You used to play your song and it took you to a place of worship? Not now. You got wounded and hurt, rejected and bruised. And now you done quit things and stop things. Or when you got in church, you were operating under a spirit of rejection because you was raised in that thing. Then all, all, that, all that stronghold, all that undelivered territory in your life needs is someone to reject you and you encamp and you just put a halo on it and that's the church too. Never realizing that all it, ta- listen, look at me. Opposition is normal. Everybody not being with you is normal. Everybody not dropping confetti and having a parade because you came through is normal. <laughs> You know what, what, what actually gets twisted is when all of these can say, I want to hear what God has deposited in you and one him or one her can shut you down. Pastor, why in the world are you? Well, I just, I I just don't know. And come to find out one, one saint that should tell you something. No one saint has the power to shut you down, man. But one stronghold tickled. One stronghold reactivated does. What the real problem is, it was, listen, I gotta share this. Y'all got, y'all got time. Y'all got time. I gotta share this. I thought I was cool when it came to bitterness. I thought I was a straight up forgiver of folk until the Lord allowed a brother to come in my church that offended me. Now, and here goes what the crazy thing was, bro. When he offended me, he done it in such a way that it reactivated, which was in me, that street stuff. You got to hear this. I'm sitting at the kitchen table, and all of a sudden I went, bang! Evelyn looked at me, she said, what are you getting ready to do? I'm going to his house and I'm going to punch him in his face. He said, I told her, I said, I'll tell you what. I said, back in the day, when we were on the street, I know what I would have done for him. I said, he pulled that stuff because I'm saved and he's supposed to operate like this. I said, but I'm going to tell you what I'm giving you. Evelyn got in front of the door and stood there and she said, the only way you're leaving out this door to, to mess your life up and your testimony up like this, you're going to have to go through me first. I said, move, girl. She said, you've never put your hand on me and I'm not moving. I said, Evelyn, it ain't right. I said, I guess you're joining him too. She stood there like that. She said, I'm not moving. I went sat there like a sulking child. That was Saturday. I had preached Sunday. (laughs) So I calmed down, meaning the demon went down. (laughs) Are y'all hearing this? So I get up that Sunday morning and I preach a little sermon. And it was fair. A little nice little sermon. Now y'all are looking shocked. 
How many have you done still bound? <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm just making us all equal. Are you ready? Now remember, there was an issue in there that I didn't even realize I was still at bound. So at the end of it, the message, Elder Francine, I've shared this before. Elder Francine came up to me. She's, she said, she said, Pastor, can I see you for a minute? She's so gentle and sweet. I said, I said, what's up? I said, what's up, Sel? What's going on? She said, can I tell you something? I said, sure. She said, Apostle, said, you've taught me just about everything I know in deliverance. I said, yeah. She said, Apostle, ever since you had that issue with brother so-and-so, you have not been yourself. She said, we can hear the anger in your sermons. She said, Apostle, you're, you're, you're angry. Apostle, you're bitter. Apostle, you need to get some deliverance. Apostle, Apostle, no, she wasn't being smart. No, no, no. She wasn't being nasty. And she was not out of order. No, I was the free train. I was out of order. She said, Apostle, she said, she said, we love. I said, Francine, really? Now, I should have known any time your wife has to stand in front of the door, brother. That's a good sign that you're pretty bound up. If your wife is pleading with you, don't act like an idiot. It's possibility you are acting like one. Anyway, anyway, I looked at her and I said, she said, Apostle, you need, you need prayer. You really need prayer. And I went to my chief son, Pastor Bailey, Pastor Bailey, and I said, I said, Lev, I said, look, that situation with brother so-and-so, I said, I've been manifesting a lot of anger and a lot of bitterness. I said, I think I need to sit down for a few weeks. I think your brothers need to pray with me. I need to deal with this. And I actually, now the whole church didn't know. The whole church knew I was manifesting. <laughs> They're not that stupid. But, it, you know, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to shut up. No, I just got with my elders and they began to pray and cast out of me some of the worldly demons. Some of that. Now, listen, I wasn't even a good thug. I was a wannabe. <laughs> Oh, you know what I'm talking about. I don't know whether they got that saying here. I was playing the dozens, man. I wasn't even all that. But, but nonetheless, I had a lot of that attitude. And they began to deal with the anger. And to deal with the thing. Now, I'm going to tell you what it activated. The thing that I had even in the life when we were selling drug was loyalty. You don't rat even if you watch it happen. If you watch it go down, you don't rat. You don't, you don't attack the one that's been helping you. But you see, Jesus didn't need that in me. Jesus did not need thug loyalty. He needed the Holy Ghost kind. Y'all don't get this. So, does anybody understand what I'm saying? I tell you what, if you really think you're delivered, what's your attitude when one of your family members actually breaks the law, actually gets locked up for what they're actually doing, why are you mad with the law then? And I'm going to leave past that. Now, I'm not talking about police brutality. I'm talking about a mentality. That's the part of my street stuff. That was still in the good reverend. Okay? Now you see how, how stripped that was? Deliverance. Identify and broke it. Now are you ready to be honest enough with yourself this weekend? Are you ready to be honest enough to know you got parts of the stuff that's in you that you operated in with the world? And if sifted well enough, it'll come up and dominate. If becoming weary in well doing, anybody weary in well doing? Talk to me, saints. My God, y'all got quiet on me. Lord Jesus. Woo! You can tell we need some deliverance up in here. We all gonna get some deliverance. Boy, y'all went like, oh, Lord, have mercy. I hate him. I hate that man. Oh, my God. When you become weary and well-doing, man, some of us don't stop going to church. We just stop operating in it. Or stop living like the church. Are you hearing me? Worn out and freshness. Let me give you another one. Amen. Everybody good? Just about done, then we'll pray. Look at 2 Timothy 4.10. Put that up. 2 Timothy 4.10. By the way, man of God, when God healed me, I saw that brother in a store. And when I saw him, my reactions were so different. Usually if, when I would see him, I didn't even want to be around him. And he came up to me. He said, he said, he said, he said how you doing? He said, how you doing, brother Arby? I said, I'm, you know, I said, I'm doing pretty, pretty good. And him and I got talking. And he went to another church. And I said to him, I said, you know, I said, the situation that happened with me and you, I said some things in my anger. I owe you an apology for that. I said, but I want to tell you something, man. I said, God used the experience we went through. Now somebody goes, well, what about he had to do? Uh-uh, I was doing me. 
Unless you want freedom, you better do you. Listen, the other guy has to deal with his temple. You got to deal with yours. Are you hearing me? And honey, now I have no reaction whatsoever against that brother. And notice I said against that brother. Because you know who you mad with and you ain't no more. Yeah. Boy, we're having fun in this state. All right. Y'all got that up there? Demas reverted back to his former place when under religious pressure. Look what Paul says here. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Got that? Now, let me tell you about Thessalonica and Demas. Demas came from a rich family. Thessalonica was a seaport town that was known for partying and debauchery. Under pressure, Demas forsook Paul. Why did he forsake him? Having loved the former world. Some saints get pulled back into worldliness. And what is worldliness? Glad you asked. 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Got that? I want to say this to some who may have bouts of pornography. Bouts of going to gentlemen's clubs. Bouts. I mean, secret move, move, moments that you make that really you ain't told about it. But they operate. The stronghold in your life is the spirit of the world. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. I will share this, this other testimony before I bring this to a, a close. One of the churches that I affiliated with in Arizona had a youth leader to come in and teach. Now that church knows deliverance. The young people knew deliverance. And the young man preached, I mean like a ball of fire. Altar full. Got that? I mean altar full. When the young boy was driving him back to his hotel, he said to him, uh, I noticed over town that y'all have a gentleman's club. And the young man looked at him and said, Ann, he said, I want you to drop me off there. And he said to himself, I'm not doing it. He said, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not dropping you off there. And what happened? He took him back to his hotel room. The young man was blown away. But what the problem was, was this. It was undelivered territory. That preacher needed to deal with that issue. Now, now, now to many of us, how in the world if he was really saved? Because I know we like things black and white. So sorry it's not that way. Let me show you how not black and white life is. Ready? Glad you asked. Jonah, could he prophesy? Yes. Did he win a whole city? Yes. Did he hate their guts? Yes. <laughs> so you can prophesy and despise a person. Got that? Samson, was he strong? Real strong. Powerful brother. Took that gate after he spent a night in the whorehouse, didn't he? Did he have, did he have a Nazarite anointing? He needed deliverance. Is anybody getting this? If you don't deal with your stronghold, your stronghold will deal with you. And one good moment of a good service does not say you're delivered. It says the anointing showed up. Never take the anointing showing up as a sign that you're just okay. Because it's not true. The gifts in our life. The callings in our life, the grace in our life does not exempt us from dealing with our lives. God have mercy. The next thing that sets us up, Matthew 4, 19, and I'm done. And then we'll have prayer. Is anybody getting anything out of this? Amen. Now, like I'm saying to you, the things, this testimony that I'm sharing with you, even about my personal life, I'm sharing them to say this to you. It's because I want us all to understand we all are dealing with stuff. When people call me and tell me some of the strongholds they have, I don't act like, oh my God, I can't believe you're that messed up. I go like, another one like me? It's, no, what is your beast that tries to pull you back? See, see, life is funny. There's some stuff just ugly. And there's some stuff we can put a tuxedo on and look good when we walk with it. But it's still a demon. Are you hearing me? 
Mark 4.19, Mark 4.19. Another thing that can get people all bound up, the enemy will position you into bondage, is the cares of this world. The deceitfulness of riches and the lust for other things entered in. Choke the word and you become unfruitful. Mark 4.19. The cares of this world is a Greek word, marumnia. Marimnia. And what it means is a distraction. Got that? The cares of this world. What is that? Pressure from the enemy using people and things. The cares of this world. Financial problems. The cares of this world. Family problems. Loss of time. Money that was due to you. And health problems. Marimnia. Cares. So many cares. Close in until the enemy snuffs you out and reactivates. Really? When you get down to it? We didn't realize that we need deliverance. We are realizing the truth. That there are certain things in our life that I know the enemy will try to reactivate. Now here goes what I'm going to say to you for your maximized deliverance tonight. Do you know what your beast is? I know this. I can't play with anger. I can't play with bitterness. Sis. I cannot play with unforgiveness. Can't do it. Got that? I can't play. Listen, I don't even play with Benadryl. Yeah, I see y'all looking at me funny. Wait a minute, brother. You got the power. I don't play with any type of drug like that. I know the difference. Then when I'm trying to get healed and I'm trying to get a feeling. Do you? Are you hearing me? If you're bound by lust, you might have to give up HBO. Because it does a job to you. If you're bound by lust, you can't look at everything. Well, somebody says, well, that doesn't bother me. Well, I'm happy for you. Totally delighted. You hear me? Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Know your beast. As I get back closer, know your personal stronghold and also know y'all's generational stronghold. Your personal stronghold is the one just related to you, your stuff. Your generational stronghold is things that keep repeating themselves in you and your family line. Sis, the bitterness thing was my personal stronghold. Got that? The drug addiction was my generational stronghold. What do I mean? Glad you asked. My grandfather was a bootlegger in North Carolina that they killed for selling bootleg liquor on the wrong side of the track. Later on, the bootlegging in my family changed from selling liquor to selling dope. Older brother, brothers after that, nephews. Uh, now the girls never seem to bother with that kind of stuff, but the guys, we were stupid like that. Are you hearing me? In my family line, it switched from alcohol to reefer to cocaine to mescaline, Dorvons, speed, and such alike. Same beast, but tripping through our generation. Are you hearing me? This was a generational stronghold. Know your personal and your generational stronghold. And by the way, you ain't got to run around and have to break it 10,000 times. I got to break it again this week, next week, next week, and the week after that, and the week after that. Come on now. Are <laughs> oh, you understanding me? That's what makes deliverance weird. Look at your neighbor said, we are not coming for weird deliverance. So the sun can set us free. And then this last thing, because I know right well we ain't going to holler across no microphone. Everybody's business. I pray that God set you free from your secret stronghold. What's that? What? What is that? A secret stronghold is stuff so personal and so shameful that you don't want anyone to hear you say it. Too embarrassing. We got some of them too. The first time that the Lord told me, Dr. Hawthorne, I had an audience that was three times the size of this. And the Holy Ghost said, you're going to preach a message on secret strongholds and then you're going to do a mass deliverance for secret strongholds. I said, well, what are they? Secret strongholds. <laughs> I can be a real genius sometime. Y'all know that. <laughs> Sis, woman of God, stood up and, I mean, the Holy Ghost brought it. I mean, he, 
brought that. You, you ever bring one that you know what I'm talking about? He brought that message. And at the end of it, I was like, like I said, I'm going to see what God does. And I said, let's go. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I said, now, you know, even as I was preaching, the very thought, the very word came up in your mind. Some of you felt a little sad. Some of you felt the embarrassment just slightly. Said, I'll never talk to anybody. That's the one. And as we begin to pray, all of a sudden, the anointing started hitting people all over the audience. It broke out like a rushing mighty wind. Weeping, crying, and falling out. And guess what? Somebody said, well, Brother Ivory, where are they getting delivered from? I don't know. <laughs> there are some things in our deliverance that only the Lord, musician please, that only the Lord can break. Tonight, as we're getting ready to close and go before the Lord in prayer, and at some point ask folks that need to come up to come up, we want to ask the Holy Spirit to help us to release the beasts that we fight ourselves. Tomorrow we're going to be here quite a while. Amen. And we're going to be hitting a lot of personal warfare in the and a lot of areas. Amen. This pretty much is the way I'm going to be coming tomorrow. You understand me? Because you see, the Lord has rubbed Satan's face in something powerful. Kalia, he rubbed the world's face in something powerful. He rubbed the devil's face in this and, and, and the devil hates it. God has taken imperfect mankind and made us a weapon of warfare. Satan is shaking his head. He's seen the holy of holies. He's seen the 24 elders and the seraphims. And he's seen them say, holy, 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 Lord God almighty. And nothing could come before the throne but holiness. And then he turns around and looks and goes like, you got to be kidding. Us who are frail and broken. Father, in the name of Jesus, let your anointing, Father,